Hello. I do enjoy some seasonal reading, so I want to recommend today my top 10 books for Halloween. Novels that have a real darkness to them, great tension, and a very high spooky-ooky factor. So, to make my recommendations, I'm wearing my Darling t-shirt today, um, not only because it's orange and black, uh, but also because I feel like the character of Darling from Roseanne embodies this kind of gothic, melancholy, Collie sensibility that seems very well suited for this holiday. So I was partly inspired to make this video because the Booker Prize podcast recently did a Halloween special in which they were talking about Halloween reads, uh, specifically the book of short stories Cursed Bunny by Bora Chun, and they had a really interesting conversation about all of these stories which do have a real darkness to them, a real edge and uh, some of the stories really are horrific, uh, but they have this great complexity to them. And I really liked in their discussion how they talked about uh, the, the many different ways that you can interpret these stories. And the thing about spooky reading is I don't like books that are just all about like the violence and horror, but also have different layers to them uh, that have this psychological richness and com complexity to, to them and uh, that also have a larger meaning and also have a good wit to them. So the Booker Prize asked me for my recommendations from the Booker Prize library of my favorite books um, that all have this and I picked out 10 which I think are all absolute winners that I loved reading and which made me really tense and gripped me and made me want to know what was going to happen, but also got me thinking a lot. So to start off with, um, I'm going to recommend two quite short books because I know around this season, some people only like to stick to like shorter reads that they can read over just a, a weekend over or a couple of days. And a real dark gem that I loved uh, is this novel called The Many by Will Menmuir, uh, which was listed for the Booker Prize in 2016. I feel like this book because like uh, people have forgotten about it a bit and just how powerful this writer is. So this novel takes place in a, a small, weird fishing village and it's narrated uh, between two different people, one man that comes to live in this village and another man who has been a fisherman there for a very long time. And it's about uh, the relationship that forms between them as they become kind of fishing buddies that go out into the bay, um, but there are increasingly less fish in this bay and some of the fish are mutating. So there's this sense that uh, the, the bay might be polluted and there might be an environmental issue there. And the only people that buy these strange fish that they catch are a very mysterious woman in gray um, who has some uh, dark co cohorts with her. And um, so you're wondering as you're reading along, like, what is really going on in this village? And what is the history behind it? And it all has a very sinister air to it and a real building tension. So for the last quarter of this novel, I was so gripped and I had to know what was going to happen. There are some great twists and turns that occur towards the end of the book. I thought it was so fascinating, but also it really plays with this tension between what is real, what is imaginary. It has this kind of dreamlike quality to it, uh, but also um, it has all this great realistic detail um, that made me feel so present um, in this weird fishing village that it's set in. Um, such a good novella. Um, also, Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin, translated by Megan McDowell, is an Argentinian novel about a woman who is in a hospital bed and a dialogue that she's having with her neighbor's son, uh, talking about a whole bunch of aspects of a, a certain um, gathering and incident and pouring over these details and members of people around them. And um, as she is lying in this bed, she's continuously reminded by this neighbor's son that she doesn't have long left 
to live and uh, but you don't really know what's wrong with her or what's going on and so again this is another book of real great psychological tension um, that at first I felt a bit bewildered and I wasn't really sure like what is happening here what is this situation but once I got to know the characters I was so gripped by this story and fascinated by it because there are so many details in it that make you think oh I, I think I know what What's going on but I'm not quite sure and so it's a story that can have so many different interpretations to it and it's one of the rare books of uh, like reading experiences where when I finished reading this book I immediately wanted to go back to the first page and reread it because I wanted to try to pick up on other things I might have missed about it if I could clarify this story and understand it completely it is, it is so fascinating and it works kind of like a dream on that level, but also it's about our connections with each other, um, how this, this mother is meditating on her relationship with her child and her friends and the degree to which we really know the people in our lives or the way that we kind of invent them in our minds and think we know them and the way that this book plays upon that tension. I think is so fascinating and makes it much a much deeper story than just kind of a, a nightmare which um, could be interpreted in so many different ways. If you're looking for a longer read there is Beyond Black by Hilary Mantel which is almost 450 pages long. Uh, it's about a medium um, and her assistant um, and their uh, communication with the spiritual world and finding a number of punters or clients um, who uh, they can communicate with the dead uh, with and Mentel was such a superb writer and the, the the language that's used in this is so powerful and evocative and and just beautiful but also has a real darkness and like sinister energy to it and um, but also there's a real great humor to this story uh, as well so Mentel is probably most famous for her Thomas Cromwell trilogy of books which I think you you could argue very strongly that the, the, this is kind of a ghost story as well especially as the bodies are piling up over time as Henry VIII has more and more enemies and and wives are done away with and yeah it's, a, it's definitely a ghost story as well but this is much more directly so about communing with the dead. But also, again, here you have the tension of like, is she really communicating with these spirits or is this all in her head? Because there's a great tension in this between um, ghosts as um, figures that are haunting the living, but also how memories are plaguing um, the, the living and um, the, the possibilities of the, the past, which went unfollowed, um, the possibilities possibilities um, of, of people um, going forward into the future and how she explores this in such a dynamic and, and rich way um, is, is so fascinating. Uh, but also there's a real great atmosphere to this novel that she, she creates, um, largely taking place on sort of the outskirts of London in the suburbs, which is a weird kind of liminal space where no one is really from there, they just kind of live there in a kind of transitory way um, in a place between other places. And so I think it's so, the setting for this is so perfect for the subject matter that she's writing about. And the more you know about Mentel's life, you could interpret this book as applying to her actual life as well. And there's some fascinating articles on the Booker Prize website um, from earlier this year in April, which I'll link below, um, which if you've read this book and want to appreciate it, even more I would recommend reading. Now if you want another book that is about spirits and ghosts, a novel that is full of them is The Seven Moons of Molly Almeida by Shehan Karuna Talaka. Uh, this wonderful, sprawling, madcap novel about a man in the immediate time of his afterlife when he returns um, to his city uh, to take care of unfinished 
business, uh, both with the living and with the dead. And so we see him moving amongst people as a kind of specter, haunting the people that he knew when he was living, but also the spirits he encounters um, in the afterlife and how many of these spirits have a vengeful edge to them. And uh, there's this like circle of violence, um, which is being perpetuated even in the afterlife in the country of Sri Lanka, um, which has been torn apart by conflict and war for a long period of, of time. And he expresses the frustration of this um, so well, uh, but but also the 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 terror and the the horror of it, um, the the real life implications of it, but also does so in such an imaginative way that the story is so evocative. Uh, I was really drawn into it, and some of the the demonic spirits that are trying to influence of Mali Almeida um, as he's going about this quest of his to to complete. Uh, a number of things before um, his seven moons ends and he has to pass on to the next plane. Uh, this this book is just so compelling and I, I loved reading it. I also like the creepy factor when a book can make you feel like there might be ghosts around you and there's this wonderful passage in the novel uh, where he writes, there are at least five spirits wandering the space you're in now, one may be reading over your shoulder Ooh. Another novel filled with so many ghosts is Lincoln in the Bardo by George Saunders, which literally mostly takes place in a cemetery as Abraham Lincoln is going to visit the grave of his recently deceased son and mourn over him. But we don't just follow Lincoln's perspective, but the many ghosts that populate this cemetery and all of the wild crazy issues going on um, in their afterlife, uh, things that are physically manifesting in their, their spirits based on what occurred to them in life, but also the emotional turmoil, which is continuing even in the afterlife. And I liken scenes in this to one of those like trashy, sensational talk shows where people are arguing about things over and over and over again, and it's like it goes on forever, um, but there is nothing trashy about this novel. It is so sophisticated and artful how he writes this story and creates these wild different characters of these spirits populating this graveyard, locked in all of these different conflicts um, to do um, with politics and racism and sexuality um, that they're they're locked in and following um, their different perspectives as they're wandering around this cemetery, but also haunting Lincoln himself, who was an actual man in mourning, but who is also in mourning for his country and the deep conflict and turmoil and rift that was in the country in his time and which still continues today. And I think that's something so powerful about this novel, the way Saunders shows that a lot of these issues are still continuing today and how he focuses on this story from history and one of the most famous figures in American history um, to, to write about this is so masterful, but in a way which is so imaginative and that um, you, you feel like you're in this haunted space of, of the graveyard with all of these tumultuous spirits. A great big book with a high gothic factor is The Little Stranger by Sarah Waters, which is a historical novel. It takes place in the 1940s in a dilapidated uh, country estate um, visited by uh, a doctor um, who tends to um, the remaining family that, that lives there that is trying to adjust to um, their their more humble position um, now that uh, the finances have left this family and the estate around them is crumbling and there also may or may not be a ghost which is haunting this space um, as it explores the, the past of um, this family and you're, you're not sure is there really a ghost there or is there a more sinister plot to 
taking place in this household. And as I talked about recently, Sarah Waters just has this wonderful, compelling way of writing with such a rich, descriptive detail and creates such a sense of atmosphere that I just whenever I start reading her books, I keep wanting to read them, no matter how many pages there are. I feel so compelled and drawn into her story. And this does have such a great, like, gothic factor that it um, it really captures the mood and the emotion of this, this setting, but also says larger things about um, political uh, conflict um, at, at that time in England and the, the changing social classes. And so has this larger meaning meaning to it. Um, this is the, the movie edition of the, the novel. I think I did see this film and I think it was like okay, but um, I, I think to really appreciate this story, you need to read the novel um, to to feel all of the, the language and the richness of Waters' descriptions. Another historically set novel that creates such a tremendous sense of atmosphere is The North Water by Ian McGuire. This is a real seafaring adventure and a very dark way. It's set in the mid-1800s. It follows a surgeon that, that joins a voyage um, traveling up the coast of Greenland and there are murders taking place. There are many sinister plots about or happen on this ship and there's treachery and um, there's so many fascinating personalities of the, the different men on um, this, this sailing voyage. And as their physical circumstances grow more strained uh, and dire, um, so too do the, the relationships between these characters, which grow increasingly tense in this, this atmosphere. And uh, it is, I, I was so drawn into this, this story and, and gripped by it. And it's so fascinating how it plays out. And you can see um, Hilary Mantel was a big fan of Ian McGuire as well. Eileen by Atessa Moshfeg is set in a New England town in the 1960s following a young woman who lives a very claustrophobic life and who is very uncomfortable in her physical body. Um, if you've read Moshfeg's fiction before, you know she has this way of writing about uh, the physicality of our bodies and the world around us in a way that really gets to some of the more repulsive aspects of it. So there's a real darkness um, to her perspective, but also to this story um, as um, she has great conflict and tension with the main person in her life, who is her widower father um, who's an alcoholic and who's uh, increasingly violent. He carries a gun around with him and um, she works at a prison and there she meets a very glamorous woman who's a psychologist and um, the it's about the bond they form with each other, how she kind of envies and desires this woman but also is in kind of conflict and intention with her and it's about um, the complexity of that relationship and a very sticky situation that they get into which has many layers to it which unfold in a surprising way over the course of the novel. So um, it is a very plotty novel that really drew me into it but also um, yeah the her power of description and um, the the complex psychologies that she portrays in this situation. And this is another book which has just been made into a film, which I saw at the London Film Festival recently. Um, it's starring Anne Hathaway as the more glamorous um, woman that works at the prison. Um, and it's very good. It, it does create a great sense of atmosphere. But again, you know, you always say the book is better than the movie. And I think um, to really appreciate the, the texture of this story, um, you really need to read the novel. I don't think any of these books has a creepier title than Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tukorczyk, um, translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. And this story, I'm um, set in a small mountain 
mountainous village, um, which is very bleak. Um, there's a lot of snow and follows a, a woman um, who has these superstitious beliefs in astrology, but also um, has strong feelings about animal rights and the, the hunting which is going on around her. And uh, a number of murders start occurring in the village. And she believes that the animals are getting back at the hunters who are terrorizing them and the members of the neighborhood that are terrorizing them. And uh, so we follow her perspective, her very odd, uh, oddball and humorous perspective, but uh, that also has a real darkness and edge to it. And it's so compelling reading this story. I was completely swept into it. And I've not had the best time trying to read some of um, Tukorczyk's other books, but this novel I was completely gripped by. And I was fascinated earlier this year, um, I got to see a great um, theatrical production of it at the Barbican in London, which was so well done and really brought the atmosphere of this novel alive, the, the real darkness to it, but also the intensity of this female character's voice following her perspective. Um, it's a fascinating story and, and I love um, a, a, a story that's narrated by an eccentric older female protagonist. And finally, I want to recommend a book which is probably one of the most straightforward thrillers that I'm recommending, which is My Sister, the Serial Killer by Oinka Braithwaite, uh, which um, was also nominated for a number of book prizes in 2019 when it came out, the Women's Prize for Fiction, but it was also listed for the Booker Prize. And I think for good reason, because there are great layers to this story, which is also filled with so much tension and intrigue that I was so compelled to keep reading it and I really enjoyed reading it. So it follows um, the perspective of a woman who's um, a sister who's always been uh, kind of humble and homely and lived in the shadow of her much more glamorous and beautiful sister. But the thing about her sister is she has a tendency to kill her lovers and they've stretched such a strong bond with each other that she helps her sister cover up these murders that that she's doing. Uh, but there's also an increasing tension in this story in their relationship as a man sort of comes between them. And um, we wonder about the motives of both of these women and the men in their lives. And um, so as it follows their relationship with each other, their, their sense of self, um, their place in society and their their relationship um, to to men um, in um, this community, and uh, so yeah, I, I I enjoyed reading this this story um, so much, and would really recommend it as well as all of these other books that I talked about. So I hope you settle into some good spooky reading um, over the Halloween period or over the autumnal period. I'm definitely going to spend some time this weekend um, reading more like atmospheric and psychologically tense books while having a lot of chocolate and sweets and stuff as well. Um, my husband recently just gave me this uh, this chocolate lollipop of a uh, pumpkin. So yeah, I'm going to tuck into that. But I hope you're doing well and reading good things. And I'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.